Prananga, good afternoon. Uh, welcome once again to the Love Spoon Workshop. Hopefully we got sound, we got pictures. Yeah, and our live stream today, we are looking at some of the basics. So we've um, got involved in some different groups on Facebook, and one of them is, is a beginner's wood carving group. So I thought it would be appropriate just to go through some of the absolute basics. So to start off, um, as you can see, I've got a little heart-shaped key ring in the vise. Reason we've got that, this is basically how I learned to carve myself, was carving little key rings. So if any of you who are starting your journey in terms of um, carving, that sort of thing, this is quite an effective way to learn. And it's doing simple little carvings and simple designs on small pieces of wood, but it just gets you used to those skills that are required to learn wood carving. So the first thing then, I've marked it out with a vertical grain. So that actually helps us, that, that makes life easier in many ways, um, having that nice vertical grain. We just had Thomas Woodcarver's just walked in, Prang Da. Um, so, so yeah, we've got that grain marked out in a, a vertical direction. And all, all we're gonna do is to just carve a simple little design on there. So what I do with this one, we start off, we measure it out. So our gouge, you can actually measure it out so you can see like so, but then we angle it right over and then cut a stop cut. We then do the same in the opposite direction. So we measure out where it's gonna go, angle over the gouge and you mark out a second stop cut. So that gives us our center point to work from. Um, yeah, so that, that, that is the, the, the sort of start of a simple design. The wood we're using here for carving this design is a little piece of teak. This is dad's favorite timber for working in. And it's, despite its reputation, it's, it's quite soft for us to, to use. So again, we're just starting off doing a series of stop cuts. The idea of this live stream then is to help out anyone who is uh, just starting, who is, who's a beginner. And you might choose to do what I've done on a, another piece that I'm going to demonstrate. And that is to actually draw the design onto the wood itself. Myself, because this is something we carve regularly, I'm not gonna actually mark out the lines. I'm gonna use the gouge itself to mark the line. You'll also notice we've got it secured in a vise. So by securing our work in the vise, it means that it's not moving about and we can get both hands on the gouge itself. So if I was carving something and holding it, you've got less control over it. Just note, got a comment there, two seconds. Good morning from South Carolina. Good morning. It's Prananda here. Good afternoon in West. In, it's a sunny West Wales. Great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, we're just um, demonstrating a few of these different cuts. So what we do again, measure out where we want our stop cuts, angle the gouge over, and just do that little stop cut. Then same on the other side, measure out where that stop cut's gonna go, angle it over and cut down into the wood. Now, um, I'm demonstrating doing that just using the pressure then of my own hands. If you want to as well, you can get a mallet and you can just do a couple of little taps just on the top there. So measure it out, angle it over and then a couple of little taps just to do that stop cut. So just to finish it off, Another stop cut that side, and that is our final stop cut, just like so. So that gives us all of our stop cuts, which will act as barriers that we can use then to add a little bit of extra detail to what we're doing. Now, if you're a beginner as well, some of the different things, um, wood, this is an area that there's a lot of talk about, and the recommendation 
generally that people will will suggest is basswoods. And it is a, an easier, more sympathetic wood to carve. But one thing we always sort of explain to people is there are alternatives. As I said, Dad learned to carve with this one, the teak. So we recycle and reclaim a lot of teak. I learned to carve with beech. I think the point I'm basically making for a beginner is if you try basswood and it's not successful for you, don't sort of give up on wood carving. Have a look, try different woods and see how you get on. So as you can see, what I've been doing, I've been using those stock cuts as a barrier, just carving into the edge, just to give it a little bit of detail. So what I do, I cut into the edge of the barrier, pull back. If you get a little bit of wood just left over like that one, you can go back over that stock cut, carve it a bit deeper and take the wood out. So you're using that stop cut, you're using it as a barrier, cutting into that edge. Now I sit to carve, some people sit to carve, some people stand to carve. So as an example here at the workshop, I sit, dad stands. It's personal preference, you use the method that suits yourself. So I've turned it round in the vise. If I was standing, I could just walk around the other side. But as I sit, I turn it round in the vise. As I mentioned, we've marked it out with a vertical grain and we just cut into that barrier just like so, using that stop cut as our barrier and just cutting into that edge just to bring out a little bit of extra detail. Same at the top. With these ones at the top then, we are working slightly at an angle and especially here, we are slightly going across the grain. One thing you can do is to sort of roll the gouge to try and work with the grain as much as possible. But as long as you've got a good sharp gouge, you should be able to uh, work, work in that direction without too many problems. Now this way here, we go in with the grain again. So we're just cutting into that center. And then the two side ones, we're cutting across the grain, but we've got a good sharp gouge and it's able to do the job easily. Going back to the wood as well, uh, we use hardwoods and we use seasoned hardwoods. And that's what we find then is, is best for our wood carving is to use uh, seasoned hardwoods. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rules and you've basically got to use what you're comfortable with and what works best for yourself. So what I've done in the center, I've actually used the reverse angle. So we're cutting that center out, just using that reverse angle, same on the top, use the reverse angle and just cut in to add a little bit of detail. Anyone as well got any questions as we're going along, feel free to ask us. If you're learning wood carving, more than happy to answer any questions that you've got. We're always delighted to, to help out. That's basically what our YouTube channel is all about, is helping, uh, helping anyone who's interested in making things in wood, helping you out to learn and, and sort of um, any issues you might be having. Our, our methods might, might, might help you out. Before you start that one, Liv, I've got something to show you and everybody else, all right? Okay, so Thomas Woodcarver's got something to show us. We've got a quick comment there. Let's have a little look. Hi there, you've got the cat and the fish craft in. Hello there, glad you can join us. There we are, we've just done our first little uh, demonstration there. Just a simple little design. So that is how I learned how to carve. We could have done with a little bit of shellac or a bit of oil. We'll, we'll, we'll grab some in a minute now. Um, oh, that's, that's a proper Welsh phrase. Has anyone come across that before? It's something we say in Wales. I'll do it in a minute now. Well, either you do it in a minute or you do it now, but that's something we say in Wales. So you can see a simple little flower design. What I would do with this, I would drill a little hole in there and we would then turn this into a little key ring. So just a, a simple example of what can be carved in a relatively straightforward and easy way. It looks straightforward. I tried a flower last week and I dig a pit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just something, um, it's, it's a good way of, of learning and it's, it's a good way of sort of developing. Interesting things then when it comes to learning, 
I the, the flower I've carved, I use these gouges, so the size and the shape is to fit the gouges. So that's something as well. If you're following patterns, sometimes it can be difficult to follow them, so um, you need to make the, the, the flower that you're doing, it needs to work for the tools that you are using. Here we are, we've got a little bit of shellac, thank you. So we could just put a little dab of shellac on there and you'll just see, again, when it comes to working with wood, as much as you can, you wanna be working with the grain. I know, for instance, wood turning is a bit different, but we're wood carvers, so pretty much all of the jobs we do, we're working with the grain. So we're just putting the shellac on, just like so, brings out the character of the carving and it brings out the character in the woods. But again, when I'm putting that shellac on, I'm applying it in the same direction as the grain. So we're putting it on in a vertical direction. Now, before we go on to our next carving, Thomas the Woodcarver's got something to show us. Well, I, I hope I can uh, show everybody this, as long as you don't mind now. No, that's no problem. <laughs> I'm not gonna worry about it. Well, I tell you what it is. I, I'm, doing, I'm doing the shellacking at the moment. Do I put and that this is our ordinary everyone? work. We're not- Here we are. This is a, a love spoon that we've been working on. Yeah, it's not set up for, for the day. And so, before, when I go to shellac, I have a little check over everything. And for instance, on the back, I make sure that all the sharp edges are off. On the outside, you see all the sharp edges. Is it showing up on the camera, Dave? No, because we're moving it too far down. There we go. That's okay, it. Okay, don't. Yeah, but I want it back then. I'm showing them, uh, we take the edges off. But what happened, as I'm going to shellac, so I notice there's a black mark there. If you can show them so, that black mark, Dave. Yeah, gonna be a bit awkward, this one. Basically, what's happened when we turn the corner, when we turn the corner with the scroll saw, uh, as we've turned the corner there, it's left a, a black mark, it's left a line. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have to try and, I think there's a couple of comments on there, Dave, if you wanna see what everyone's asking. Um, we're gonna have to try and take that line out. So that's something that happens as we're scroll sawing that profile. And when it comes to our work then, for anybody who's looking at different styles of wood carving, we use Is a combination, sure um, yeah. hopefully so. Yeah. Um, yeah. We use a combination of um, scroll saw and wood carving. So that's that's the way we do it. So we use the scroll saw to cut a profile, and then afterwards we we use the, the hand carving skills. Okay. So what we do then, we just demonstrate with that little black mark. And it's very interesting because I've spent I've spent working on this love spoon. I've spent anything anything between five and fifteen hours working on this spoon, and I've been carving it, and it's interesting how you, you sort of get into a zone with it where I hadn't even noticed, and I've done the finishing, I've sanded it, I spent a long time with it, and I just didn't see that mark. But that's the thing, when you're finishing, you are looking for little blemishes and stuff like that. So all I've done- I know, I know it's true, it's, it's true, you know, but- Yeah, it's, it, it's always gonna be there if you leave it, isn't it? But that's, you know, that's how we try and- So we just take that one out, to, um, and then- Make it right. Absolutely, once we've done this one then, um, we'll go on to our next carving. Yeah. As we're talking to um, about beginners learning wood carving, you've been carving for over 50 years. Yeah. Have you got any sort of words of wisdom for people getting into it? Any yeah. advice? Well, definitely don't give up on the first attempt. <laughs> yeah. If it doesn't work out, then it doesn't, it doesn't come, you know, keep persevering um, and eventually, you know, try different timbers, uh, different tools even, um, and different styles of carving. Um, you know, and, and just be as, as patient, um, but there don't give up. Because there's something else now that I've noticed on this one, and, and I know I'm being picky now, but these are the things you, you, you notice and try and avoid. Because we are holding this now in the vice div, you've got, a little a few little marks. Darker mark there and a darker mark there. So I'm shellacking now 
So all I'll do, I'll take it this into where I do the shellacking and I'll just use a little bit of sandpaper. What it is, it's, it's the polish that, um, that's developed yeah, as we put it in the vise. And so it's just little things that you, you sort of pick up as you go on. So we'll, um, you can barely see it probably there, but you can definitely see the darker mark there and the darker mark there. There we are. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. I won't right. complain anymore. I, go, I won't shellac it now. So I? now now he's uh, picked out all of the mistakes that I've made on that love spoon. We'll go on to our next carving. Right. This one. This is actually a carving. I always say that dad does better than myself. Another little flower. So flowers are great things for learning to carve because you can make them as simple or as complicated as you want to. So with this particular one, it's an important flower here in Wales because it's our national emblem. And we start off working on the trumpet. For those of you as well interested in the woods, I'll just see if anyone's got a question there. Uh, that's it. Um, just commenting on what Dad was saying there. Yeah, for those of you interested in the, the wood, this is tulip wood. Get a beautiful, not always in it, but you get a beautiful um, colour in it. Again, this has been marked out with a vertical grain. So for wood carving, that is always our preference, is to mark out with a vertical grain. Now, I've done some projects, some scroll saw projects recently, where I've actually marked it out with a horizontal grain. And part of the reason for doing that is, is to create the effect. Um, I did one at Christmas with the Three Wise Men and it created the effect of almost like mountains or something like that in the background. But when it comes to wood carving, as a general rule, for our style of wood carving, we're marking out with a vertical grain. Just check again, two seconds, sorry if there's any questions. Uh, daffodil, is that the flower? Yes, yeah, spot on. That's the one we're doing, is we're working on a daffodil. So we start off on that trumpet, and then we've got our petals at the back. And again, this is something, if you're learning to carve, how, over the years, I, I've actually carved this. I've changed the style that I, that I do it in. So we mark out our stop cuts. And the reason that we recommend doing simple little flowers to learn carving is because you are learning the skills. You'll also do a few different things like you'll pop out petals and things like that. So you start to learn what do you do when it goes wrong? How do you deal with that? So you can carve the design deeper, you can adapt the design, that sort of thing. So you, 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 you start to develop strategies for dealing with mistakes because I don't like calling them mistakes in some ways. That's how you develop new designs and new ideas is if something goes wrong, have a look at it and decide what can you do with it. Wood carving, working with wood it's it's that sort of material you look for solutions as opposed to dwelling on on the problems so you can see we've got a basic profile there we've got four petals on our flower we're just going to put a little stem on it as well so just two cuts like so another aspect then you may want to look at if you're learning wood carving is to do with the tools now, when you're learning, it can be a bit overwhelming because there's so many different styles of tools, you know, and depending on what carving you want to do, uh, there, there can be different ways to go with it. What I recommend people to do when they're starting out is to get one or two good quality gouges and focus on just having a small selection as opposed to getting higher volume of lower quality gouges. Because the steel and the sharpness that you can get into better quality gouges makes a big difference to your work and it, it allows you to do more and to produce better quality work. 
So the gouges that we use, we use um, Herring Brothers and Addis gouges. They're vintage wood carving gouges and they, they do do an excellent job. So it's the same principles that we demonstrated in our first simple little flower where we use that barrier, that stop cut, we just cut into that edge just to give us a little bit of extra depth and detail to our carving. Afterwards, again, we put a little bit of shellac on for you to see it. So it's just a series of stop cuts. And that's what we're doing. The carving style that we often use is referred to, it's what Dad refers to as low, low relief carving. So again, I've done all of my carving in the one direction. We then turn it round in the vise and we're going to do carving back in the other direction as much as possible. We've got that vertical grain marked out, so we want to be carving as much as possible with the grain itself. So you can see just doing that detail around the edges of those petals, just giving them a little bit of depth. The final one like so. So it's carving, you cut into that barrier and pull back. If you need to go deeper into the wood, just go back over that barrier. And again, explaining that process, measure it out, angle it over and cut down into the wood. So let's just finish off. Excuse the telephone in the background, somebody trying to get hold of us. So we're just going to do a little bit of detail just into the trumpet of our daffodil. There you might notice that the wood is just chewing a little bit and that's because we're going across the grain, but we can tidy that up. So we do a little bit more. That gouge as well, this is what happens. Could probably do with just a little bit of sharpening. So good sharp tools, they're really important to the process of wood carving. Same again then, we're gonna use the, as we demonstrated on the first carving, we're gonna use the reverse angle, cut in like so. And to finish off the trumpet, we're just gonna angle it just like so, all the time using those stop cuts just to build the shape up. Now the final touch with this one, we use like a skewer gouge and we put a few little lines just to add an extra detail to our petals. So there we are, that is a simple daffodil carving. I think he's just gone in the other room with the shellac. So when he comes back, I'll get the shellac so we can we can show you. Now the next one that I'm going to do is a is a rose carving. And because this is a little bit more complex, what I've done is I've given myself some guidelines to work from. So we'll start off using those guidelines. I'll have a quick check as well if there's any questions coming. Afternoon, Tommy. There we are. Oh, glad to have you all with us. Thank you for joining us. So what we're going to do with carving our rows, what I basically do, I do a, a, a simple drawing on there of what I want, but I tend to, whilst I use the, the guidelines, I don't sort of stick rigidly to following it. I, I will adapt the design as we go along to suit us. So this time, different to the other carvings, instead of measuring it out and then angling it over, I actually want to cut the middle out, because that's how I do the rows. So we angle the gouge to cut out. So that's the first part of the process, is to actually cut the middle out, just like so. Again, those practical, simple parts of the process, mark it all out with a vertical grain, We've then drawn the design onto the wood. I've drawn it to suit the gouges that we use. So we're just going to do our stop cuts. And the idea with a rose is to get, uh, to sort of, how can I explain? It's, it's to have almost folding layers where the layers of the rose fold one behind the other. 
So we're just going to go around the outside just like so. So it's those simple principles that we use time and again. Stop cuts, use it as a barrier. If you need to go deeper into it, cut your barrier deeper into the wood and then carving into the edge. So we're just going around our top petal. I'll just come around a little bit further, like so. And so this is the fundamentals then when it comes to wood carving. So as you sort of progress, you still apply those same sort of fundamental skills to the, the, the process of, of your wood carving. There we are, we're around just like so. Anybody as well, if you've got any questions, if you're learning wood carving and you want to ask us any questions about the process that we use, as Dad was mentioning with his advice, that is one of the key things with it. There are so many different styles of carving, different approaches. It's have a go at different ones and, and find out what suits yourself. And what can happen, you can start wood carving in one style and then over time you may find that you prefer and enjoy more a different style. So give it all a go, try different woods, Try different styles of tools, different approaches. Find what suits yourself. This one then that we're carving, it's a piece of mahogany, a recycled piece of wood. And that's what we do. In terms of sourcing wood, we recycle it and reclaim it. It's a, it's a relatively inexpensive method for getting hold of, of the wood itself. So that is a method that we utilize quite a lot. So as we're going along with this one, you start to see those uh, stop cuts. You start to see the shape taking form. We're mainly doing this then with two different gouges. They're pretty much the same sweep, these ones. They're both Herring Brothers of London. That one's a number three and that one's a number four. So they're quite a shallow sweep but I find they're fantastic for, for doing this job. Now another uh, part when it comes to learning wood carving that comes into the equation is um, tools, uh, sorry, sharpening tools. And that's another important part of the process. Just see if there's any questions there. Uh, hi, could you recommend a good starter set of carving tools? I find it hard to work out how to do all cuts and such a pattern guidance, because, yeah, right, so those two questions, um, good start ones, yeah, um, something that's, that's basically a little bit better quality than the, than the average, uh, somewhere on the bench, I demonstrated recently a beginner set of, of gouges, and that they're okay, but they're not up to much at all, I, I would suggest a company, some of the companies go in now, You've got Sorby, they produce some good gouges, they're worth getting in touch with. There's Ashley Isles, they do some uh, good gouges as well. And then Henry Taylor, these sorts of ones. That is for our style of wood carving. So we're securing it in a vise, both hands on the blade. One is basically pushing, the other is guiding. So what I'm doing here, I, I'm, I'm pushing more with my right hand and guiding with my left hand. But yeah, those ones there. Also, if you're interested in like vintage gouges, you can get on eBay. If you do a search for vintage gouges, you can get some uh, vintage ones like the um, Addis ones and uh, the, the Herring Brothers. It's just the quality of steel. Unfortunately, a lot of the, the steel that is produced, it's not of such a good quality. And what happens, they start off fine, they lose their edge quite quickly, and it's quite difficult then to, to get a good good edge on them. I will give you a second opinion on it as well. We've got Thomas the Woodcarver here. Um, recommend a starter set of gouges. I suggested Sorby, Ashley Isles, or Henry Taylor's. Yeah, I think those for, are fine. 
um, as opposed to the beginner sets. Yeah. What you can do, so you can get one or two really good good gouges as opposed to getting lots, and, and then you, you've got a problem. Uh, the other one then, in terms of marking out, yeah, the um, uh, we, we basically, you can actually draw the design then onto the, the wood itself. So that's a, that's a method that you can use. I don't know if there's a follow-up there. Uh, one of my uh, two cherry German, German company. I have had. Yeah, the, um, yeah, the Germans and the Swiss gouges. We've got, they're, they're, we've got some, we, there's, there's yeah. a few German ones we got. They're, de they're decent, the ones we got, they're Hero, and they're, they're decent. Um, and it, yeah, they, they, they do a decent job, but those are the recommendations um, that we would give from the ones the ones we know. Yeah, in terms of marking out, that's that's what you can do is sort of mark it out using a pencil and then um, use those as rough guidelines, but adapt your design to fit with, with your tools. That's one thing I would uh, would suggest with it. Did you have something to... Yeah, there's a telephone number there for you to ring back. <laughs> no problem at all. I think that's to do with um, somebody wanting us to help out with the school. So as a lot of you may know, we make Love Spoons. And some of the schools at different times, they do, they do um, almost competitions where they get the children to design. Well, it's a project. Really, it's a project, it's, that's it's right. A, it's an excellent project. Yeah, it is. Because... Um, you know, you, you, you start with, you, you can get your children, students, whatever, to design their spoon on paper, uh, and then they can they can decide then what material they want to use. Yep. Traditionally, obviously, love spoons would have been made from wood, but you can use clay, you can use other materials to Absolutely. Um, make your love spoon from. And um, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a nice way to get children interested. It's relevant today now because this live stream is all towards getting started with wood carving. And the Love Spoon is perfect, isn't it? Because a lot of the skills that you need for wood carving, you can learn and apply to, to, to making Love Spoons. Because Love Spoons, you can make them in a simple way, but you can make them in a very complex way too. So the Love Spoon is a great one to get involved with because it, it allows you to progress um, your skills. Yeah. Um, I, I just get to... It allows you as well, see, where um, you can express yourself, you can tell stories, you can express a message through through the work that you do. You just... Oh, I'll get the other one. That's going to be the best. Example. No problem at all. He's going to get some examples there to, to show you some of the different ones. So as you can see... Going back to this one here to explain, we're just building up those layers and the idea is to create the effect that the it's the petals sort of folding behind one another. And that's how we do it, is to use those stop cuts and to carve into the edges. It's a popular symbol on love spoons, the idea that you hope love will blossom, but we do quite a lot of love spoons where there's a, an English Welsh connection so for England the rose and as you saw before you've got the daffodil one thing as well is the shellac if you've got some shellac yeah, now we I'm can the shellac back now okay it's just these two dear, just here we are Thomas the woodcarver has got two spoons to show everybody well one spoon and one bowl yeah I'll get the shellac as well. so we turn it round in the vise again so you do as much carving as you feel appropriate in the one direction turn it round you may notice we're going across the grain there slightly and we just try to rotate the gouge a little bit just to get a cleaner cut like so working in to the center adding a little bit of extra depth to the petals as we go I'm going to just take out that pencil line and shape that petal in the opposite direction there we'll do the same with all of these there we go. He's just. Are you gonna I'm show just, everybody? Yeah, I'm just cleaning the, cleaning yeah. the dust off just a little bit. Uh, We've got two examples here to show you. Bring them in, show everybody so they, yeah. they can see there. There we are. Well, that's the first one, Dave. Yeah, so that's the first example. 
And as you might be able to pick that out, that's dated 1843. So that's an example of an early love spoon. And the amazing thing about this is how thin it actually is. It's an incredible, so if we incredible on, piece of craftsmanship. So it shows you how you can make simple spoons, but you can make very elaborate designs. There we go. And that's the pair for it. Again, dated 1843. And you can see very, very fine, delicate piece. I would suggest many, many, many hours spent sure working fork, on those ones sure. there. Yeah, that's the fork you can see. Because, you know, often very you delicate. see it at a fork, a spoon, and a knife as well. And, you know, the reason I'm showing you these, actually, is because uh, as I was in there doing the shellacking, you realise that you're actually... <laughs> sounds crazy, but we're actually, we're actually making antiques. Um, Love spoons, well you can see, 1843 that one is, um, and uh, as long as they looked after, um, you know, hopefully, eventually, um, they will become heirlooms. Yes. Yeah. And it's interesting actually when we get contacted by a lot of people, different people contact us about um, making a love spoon, and, and quite often they do state that, that they hope it will become a, a family heirloom. So we're just finishing off. A little bit of depth on this petal here. Well, hang on back up there. So yeah, brilliant. So as much as possible, we're working with the grain. We're just going to take a little bit well, the of the sharp edge off. For that, I think it's boxwood, Dave. Those two. Boxwood, those, those ones. ones? Yeah, the ones we can read. There we are. Two good examples, though, of, of what can be made when it comes to two love spoons. And nice for us as well, because it's so different from our own style that we make our love spoons. But that's why the love spoon is a good one for, for beginners, because you can develop your own style and incorporate the things that, that you like and the style of carving you like into the work that you do. So I'm just going to sand that over just a little bit, just like so. And we put a coat of shellac. And again, as I mentioned, as much as possible when you're learning, but whenever you're doing your woodwork, ideally really I should be using a block. So, because otherwise it's following the contours of your thumb. But we quite often don't use a block because it, it can't get into certain areas of the carving. But you can see that I'm sanding it in the direction, in the direction of the grain. So there we are. You wanna put a little coat of shellac well, on you, there? You can show this one as well. Yeah, and we'll demonstrate that then for everyone. So I just get a little bit of shellac, and I will shellac the two carvings that we've just demonstrated. I've got a little bit too much on the brush. So that there, that's a simple, simple version of our rose, just like so. And then next to it, well, I suppose tim that timber's interesting. Did you explain what timber it was? Yeah, a bit of. Um, a uh, bit of tulip wood. Yeah, but we also call it American white wood. There we go. So there are a few Americans. Uh, yeah, we refer to it in the UK as. as Perhaps um, they can uh, enlighten us on that one. As American white wood. That's very appropriate for this wood, uh, for, for this week, isn't it? Because it's the, the rugby, England, Wales on the weekend. Yeah. So we got we got the Welsh daffodil and the English rose side by side. There we are. So that's another couple of examples of carving there. I think Dan's gonna just jump in two minutes because he wanted yeah. to demonstrate something. Can you see that yeah. one on the... I'll just see if there's any questions to be answered. Nobody in the spelling anything today, nobody yet. Uh, no, yeah, no, I think that's everybody. Uh, right, so yeah, that's another example of uh, another love spoon you can see there. That's the... Um, that's again over a hundred years old. That one, and yeah. we believe that this was this was probably made for an Eisteddfod competition piece. Yeah. So the, the so it's a Welsh it's a Welsh lady for, there with a for a carving uh, competition holding a little basket. But um, the um, the work involved in that one, you know, is quite a quite a difficult one. Quite a twist on it, and uh, most likely it would have been entered into the Eisteddfod. Yeah. And um, we we managed to obtain it. 
That's right, so we keep Hello, that one on display for everyone to see. Now on to our next carving. And this is a little bit more specific for spoon carvers and love spoon carvers. So we're just gonna demonstrate the process of carving the bowl. But it's relevant again because it shows you the basic principles of wood carving in a slightly different context to what we've shown you already. Um, and it just gives you an idea of how you can scoop out a bowl. So you'll see various methods. There's sort of hook knives and things like this that you'll see people carving bowls out. But we carve it out using a simple gouge, just like so. I'll just move that back a bit further in the vice suit to see. Now the method that we use is to put a center line and then an outside guide line. Mark that out with the vertical grain and we just work into the center, just like so. And we work our way back to that outside line. So we use that back line as a guide to carve to. And we just work on the shape of the bowl. And over a period of, period of time then, you're just going deeper into the woods. And that's the key is to get, give your bowl depth not to go too deep, that you get too thin and run the risk of light starting to show through the back of your spoon or if you get really keen, you may even go right the way through the wood itself. So we've just about got that shape on the back of the bowl. Working with the grain as much as possible. We then turn it round in the vise just like so. And then we work into that center line again to shape the front of the bowl. So it's another example of those simple rules, simple principles of wood carving. Now the tool that I'm using, you can see it's just a, a fingernail gouge. So we've got a slight curve on there. That is ideal for the job itself. So for those as well asking about a beginner set, I would recommend a couple of fingernail gouges. So for instance, you've got that one there and that one there for doing um, our little flower. This one here for doing the bowl and the back of our daffodil. Those, those sort of gouges for starting out will allow you to do quite a lot of work. But as we were saying, if you contact people like Ashley Isles, Sorby and uh, Henry Taylors and ask them for a beginner's set of wood carving tools, the kind of thing that I always say that you don't need a lot of, you know, you only need one of these. I also, some would argue differently, but I would suggest that, where is it? No, that's not a V. There's, there's the V-shaped gouges. We got, someone in, we got some in there. You only really need one of those for the style we do anyway. So as you can see, we're just building up that shape, getting our depth on the carving as well, gradually getting deeper into the woods. And then afterwards, you have the choice, of course. You can leave it off the gouge, which is some people's preference in terms of the finish, or you can sand it. So we're usually sanding it to finish off it gives it a nice smooth finish but that's what you're doing you're working with the grain there does come a point as well with this where we do go across the grain just to finish it off and i will demonstrate that for you all to see but as much as possible you're carving with the grain the wood here this time is a piece of sycamore but again, it's a good example to show you how you can use different woods, all sorts of different timbers to do your carving from. We're just working back in the other way just to match up now with the front. Just like so. 
and where you have this little bit just left over at the end can I clean it up without having to do it? What you can do, so you can just come across just to tidy that bit up. But I got a feeling that we're gonna be able to do it. Yeah, we're gonna be able to do it today without needing to do it. If you basically, what I'm getting at, if you do end up with a bit left over in the middle, you can just use a gouge just to come across like so. Whilst you are going across the grain, you can just use it to tidy up. Today, though, we, we didn't need to do it. So that just gives you an idea of how you can carve out a simple bowl. It's just using that center line to cut into and an outside line to work your way back to. Now then, final one, I will just demonstrate for everybody to see. And that's carving like a twist. So to create the effect of a twist under and over. So on this love spoon, it's a Celtic style twist or not, and it's a popular way of doing things, a, a, a popular design that, that we use. It's not a chubby checker, is it? It's not a chubby checker, no. 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 You can do the twist. So what we do for this, again, we do our stop cuts, just like so. And the idea is to create the effect where it's going over and under. Just check if there's another question there. Well, we've got Midnight Joker. Great to have you with us again. There we are. Right, so again, the spoon's marked out with a vertical grain. This time we're working with oak, a timber that quite often is avoided, but we find carves beautifully. Going back as well, I mentioned the sharpening and there's a lot said about sharpening when it comes to the tools. Ourselves, we use a Tormek, which is a really good system for sharpening. But in terms of the sharpening, what we're generally doing, we're using external angle gouges. So we're sharpening on that outside edge. You get a little burr on the inside, take the burr off and then strop the metal. So polish it up until you get a sheen on it. You can get other things, and if you're only doing carving then as a, as a hobby and an interest, and you're looking for an inexpensive method for sharpening, uh, I would suggest getting a little slip stone like that, and then a leather strop to polish the metal up. So all you're doing for sharpening is you're sharpening on the external angle, you get a little burr on the inside, take the burr off and then polish the metal, strop the metal to, to sharpen it up. Because I've seen, uh, as I said, we've, we've just joined a, a few of the, the, the different pages on, on Facebook, different groups. And I've seen people saying that they're having to sharpen like every five cuts and things like this. If you're having to do that, that's something's not, something's not right. You should be getting a lot more time out of a good sharp gouge than five cuts, basically. Any other thoughts on sharpening? Well, it's an expensive item if you sharpening it five cuts. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you'll end up with no gouge after about a week. Um, so it's, you're gonna be replacing your gouges pretty quick. And this is the thing, as I said, we're working with vintage gouges over a hundred years old. And our hope then, you would hope that they would last, it should, it should last you a, a lifetime, shouldn't they? You know, I mean. Oh, it, your chisel should have been cool. We've got, we got one, we got we one got, particular chisel here. You've got gouges at hundreds, uh, over a hundred years old. It's, it's, it's got, um, G Bowling was one owner. That's right. So yeah, when it comes to tools, if you're sharpening as frequently as that, there's something, something not, not quite right there. But we, the, the one, two, three. Yeah, we, we put that one in front. There's that one that I carved the bowl out with, that's the marples, the vintage marples. And there's about three or four names on here. And yeah. as you can see, I mean, originally, originally that would have been yeah. easily down to there, but it, it's gone through three, three generations. Yeah. And the last, so, the last person I had that, I worked in the occupational therapy with a gentleman called Harry Morgan. And yeah. He worked for Turner's of Cardiff. He'd, he'd served his, 
apprenticeship with Turner's, a very good firm, and um, they knew him quite well. And that's, you know, that was the last person um, that, that used it. Yeah. Did his father use it as well? No, no the, the, the others are previous owners, you see. He, he had it from another child. Ah, right. You know, often the tradesmen, when handed they, their when tools. they retire or passed away, they, they would often perhaps sell the tools to the apprentices. Now, I reckon, here we are, I reckon that everybody will probably be quite interested. Why don't you explain a little bit then of your background? So we'll give a little bit of an insight for everyone into, you know, how, how we sort of came about to be a family business and stuff like that. What was your training? What were you mainly doing? What was well, your... I was very fortunate because um, I served my time as a joiner, carpenter joiner. And there's always a bit of sort of controversy about you know, joinery, carpentry, and now of course you, you have site work as well. So um, I was fortunate to work in, um, in a hospital doing, you know, it was an old-fashioned hospital, so there was some excellent work, um, you know, some of the, there was a lot of pitch pine used, and um, so we were fortunate to, um, you didn't just fix a door, you made the door, and then you went and fixed it as well, you'd make a door and a frame, you'd fix that, um, and, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a, an excellent sort of opportunity for anybody really. It, um, it helps it helps us with the uh, processing of the wood, doesn't it? The yeah. early stages, yeah. the training that you had. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the different, you work with different carpenters and they had different, I always remember another another joiner in the, in the workshop was Alan Cox and he used to put um, little bits of wood under the bench uh, branches from trees that he picked up, uh, a bit of holly, a bit of um, oak and all the rest, and he would just leave it under the bench a year or two, and then, then he could use it for, uh, well, ash, for instance, they would use ash for handles and hammers and chisels and that kind of thing, and, you know, people made their own um, tools, so, uh, it, you know, it was... We were really fortunate to have that kind of an apprenticeship. Time was not the same issue, was no, it? No, there was no, you didn't have any time. You, you were given, uh, you, they gave you a requisition, you'd look at the job, you, you'd go down onto a ward, maybe there was something to repair, and uh, you'd go as an apprentice with you. you you'd be alongside a carpenter, and um, he would teach you the ropes. So moving on then to wood carving, what were your earliest experiences then of wood carving, and what are your early, what are your earliest thoughts of of how you developed as a wood carver, thinking now? And anybody who's who's just starting out, what would you, what is your thoughts and experiences on on that? Well, if, I think you you've got to follow what you what you desire, what you really want to um, pursue, what kind of um, style, you know, if you want to go into turning, for instance, if you like machinery and you, you're happy to uh, do lathe work, you know, then it, it never appealed to me uh, working on a lathe. Um, but I did, even in school, we were fortunate um, to, to be able to use a lathe in school. And um, so, you know, it, it's having opportunity really to, um, it's, it's very difficult today, I know, because of health and safety, but have the opportunity to um, learn skills. I mean, we, we used to do woodwork uh, in school and you'd make simple things like a teapot stand, for instance. Um, but you learned how to make a, um, a little halving joint, a mortise and tenon, you, you know, we actually learned practical things like that. Um, and then during our apprenticeship, um, you know, once they started to learn the techniques of the machinery, well then, you know, I, I, I made furniture, chairs. Um, so it's all of these things then all help in terms of 
what we do today because it just gives you a, a wider sort of knowledge and a wider experience of, of different types of woodwork and different methods, different things basically. Yeah, because you, you know, you, you still go back to those basics that you were taught. Um, circle of saw, planing machine, how to convert timber down to the right size and all that kind of thing. So, um, And that, that is an interesting point as well. We've actually still got a lot of, um, for instance, we've got, a, we've got two DeWalt band saws that are probably about 30 or, well, probably about 40 years old now. And it, it's interesting how um, that kit lasted. You've got a coronet and things like that, haven't you? Oh, so yeah. that, and it's, it's it, because the, the, that sort of kit is not made, the, the, the ones now, they don't last in the same way as, as, as a lot of the kit that we, we still use. I mean, that's one of the saddest things of all, is, is that, you know, in our country, um, you know, they've stopped making uh, the coronet uh, well, tell them the story about when your coronet saw go shows that this is a showing a, a change in the times. Tell them what happened when your coronet saw broke. Which was that though? The, um, I thought you said something about them coming from Derby. Oh, that was a, that was for a big planing machine. Um, it, that, was, that was in the hospital when we were doing our apprenticeship. I think it was Cooksley was the name of this particular planing machine. I think it was an 18 inch, 20 inch. A uh, planing machine with a thicknesser, and they bought a um, they bought this new machine, and um, they weren't happy with the way the um, cutters were sort of spinning. There was a, a little bit of a sort of a rumble in the bearings, and um, I contacted the firm, and the firm, two hundred miles away, sent an engineer down and um, he came down, stayed for the day, he took the bearings out, put new ones in and um, done and dusted, there he was, you know, imagine that happening today. So there we are, if you've got problems with your machine, try contacting somebody like DeWalt and see if they'll come send an engineer down for it. Well they, they'd have to come from China first of all, yeah? so you'll have a bit of a job like, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one by Midnight Joker saying about the uh, the fundamentals of understanding grain and things like that. Yeah, it's 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 spot on. Um, where if you know those those sort of basic principles, I mean this carving, if you mark this out, I do think you know for beginners, that's a really relevant point. If you mark this out with a horizontal grain, you're up against it before you start, and that's you know, for ourselves doing it on a daily basis. If this was marked out with a, a horizontal grain as opposed to a vertical grain, it would be causing us a lot of problems because you've got that weakness, so it'll break more easily. It's more difficult to carve. Yeah, understanding grain. I think that is one of the key areas for, for beginners. You think that may be why so many beginners gravitate one of the reasons why so many gravitate towards the basswood, the line, it's possible, isn't it? Because you can get away yeah, with it a yeah. bit. And, and it's, you know, a lot of things today, <laughs> it's all very fast and furious. Uh, and woodwork, um, as I say, when I served my apprenticeship, you, you, would, you didn't have to um, uh, hang a door you, you know, you weren't given so many hours to hang a door. You, you, you hung the door and it took as long as it took. You, you, you weren't... Um, Under the constraint of time. That's right. It, uh, and, and that was, you know, that's the worst thing of everything, unfortunately. You know, it's all... We're, as I said, we're very fortunate because we enjoy what we do and um, we, we, we very much sort of relax and... It's great fun. It's nice to be able to share it with everyone. Hopefully, as I said, there's a few thoughts and ideas that may direct somebody in, in the right, right sort of direction with their carving. 
There we are. We just finished this one off as well. You may notice I've just gone on to carve in just a simple little spoon. It's a little Christmas decoration it is in fact. Believe it or not, we're already uh, we're already organising ourselves for well, we're late in the year. Christmas things, aren't we? We are. But there we are. Let's get let's get everything together what we demonstrated. So you can see with that twist again, vertical grain. You mark those stop cuts down into the wood. We shape it. Afterwards, we will then sand it. So you've got a simple one like that one there. You've got the methods then for doing the bowl that we use. Horizontal line working to the outside edge. Again, vertical grain. We've got the carving there of a rose. So a good example for how we mark out the design onto the wood itself before we get started. We got, we got our daffodil just in there, our national emblem, and a simple little flower as well. So, yeah. Right, and I'm gonna push this one in there as well. There we are. Just, because, well, this is relevant as well. When it comes to, if you're learning, if you're beginning with the, the wood carving, uh, finishing. And so we, we, we've been doing it, as I was saying, Dad's been carving for over 50 years. And you're always trying different things, learning different things. So we've done, on numerous occasions, demonstrations of how we shellac the spoons. So we put three coats of shellac sand and seal and rub it down in between. What we've started doing is a final coat of beeswax mixed with linseed oil. Excuse me, and we're finding that that then, that gives it a slightly finer finish. Oh, Again, also, if you're always hands, learning. Always. And yeah, it's, it's, it's you, interesting. You feel. I, I would say with, with, with using that as a final coat, <coughs> it's slightly more tactile uh, than, than working with the shellac. Although three coats of shellac is, is a nice finish as well. Yeah. There we are. Thank you again for joining us. Hopefully that's useful. If you've got any uh, questions or anything, remember you can get those in to us. But yeah, thanks for joining us. And as always, we'll be back again soon with more videos. Thanks again.